Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Kafka is one of the most popular messaging systems out there today. You might not know this, but 80% of the Fortune 100 companies use Kafka to handle massive streams of data. Kafka is also a common topic in system design interviews, so understanding its core concepts will not only help you in your daily development tasks, but also give you an edge in interviews. Starting today, I'll guide you through Kafka's key concepts. Since there's a lot to cover, I'll break it down into multiple videos. In this video, we'll focus on these main concepts, topics, producers, consumers, offsets, and partitions. Let's start with topics. A topic in Kafka is the basic unit for organizing data. It's similar to how tables are used in traditional relational databases, collections in MongoDB, or indexes in Elasticsearch. In Kafka, a topic is how we categorize and organize data. A Kafka cluster can have many topics. For example, you might have an order topic to store order data, an access log topic for website access logs, or a user behavior topic for tracking user actions. While a topic is a logical concept, under the hood, it corresponds to physical files. Each topic is stored in its own set of files, so the data is physically separated. You can think of a Kafka topic like a queue in a traditional messaging system. You might even see the terms topic and queue used interchangeably. In Kafka, the producer is the role responsible for sending messages to a topic, and the consumer reads messages from a topic. There can be one or many producers and consumers, even hundreds. A producer can send data to multiple topics, and a consumer can read from multiple topics. Also, an application can act as both a producer and a consumer. Typically, business applications don't directly communicate with the Kafka server. Instead, they use Kafka's client APIs. For example, producers use the producer API to send messages, and consumers use the consumer API to read messages. Kafka supports multiple programming languages, so you can find client libraries for Java, Python, Node.js, and more. Kafka can handle different message formats like strings, JSON, or binary data. Regardless of the format, all messages are stored in Kafka in binary form. Before sending a message, the producer must serialize it. Similarly, when reading a message, the consumer has to deserialize it. Next, let's talk about offsets and some related concepts. To make this easier to understand, think of a topic as an array. Messages are stored in this array in sequence, and each position has a number. That's the offset. It's similar to the index in an array. There are two important offsets in Kafka, the producer offset and the consumer offset. The producer offset shows where the next message will be written while the consumer offset indicates where the next message will be read. You can think of two pointers. One tracks the current producer offset, and the other tracks the current consumer offset. When the array is empty, both the producer and consumer offset start at zero. Let's say a producer sends five messages, A, B, C, D, and E. Message A is stored at index zero, B at index one, and so on, with E at index four. Now, the producer offset is 5. If a consumer has read the first three messages, A, B, and C, the consumer offset will be 3. Each time a message is produced or consumed, the corresponding offset increases. For example, if the producer sends two more messages, F and G, the producer offset becomes 7. If the consumer reads one more message, its offset becomes 4. As you can see from this example, Kafka's high performance largely comes from its sequential write and read operations. When producing data, messages are simply appended to the end of the file. This is called append-only writing. Consumers read messages sequentially without modifying any data. Since both operations rely on disk-based sequential I.O., Kafka can handle large volumes of data efficiently. In practice, the producer offset is managed automatically by the Kafka cluster, so producers don't need to worry about it. The consumer offset, on the other hand, 
is managed by both the Kafka cluster and the consumer. So when we refer to Kafka's offset in everyday use, we're usually talking about the consumer offset. When consuming messages, the consumer provides the current offset to Kafka, telling it where to start reading. After reading the messages, the consumer is responsible for incrementing the offset. When starting to consume messages, a consumer can choose to start from the earliest available offset or the latest one. During consumption, if an error occurs, the consumer can reset the offset to an earlier position, allowing it to reread messages. This capability is often referred to as message replay in Kafka. Now that we understand offsets, let's introduce the concept of consumer lag. This refers to the difference between the producer offset and the consumer offset. For example, if the producer offset is 7 and the consumer offset is 3, the consumer lag is 7 minus 3, which equals 4. In practice, if the consumer lag is small, it means the consumer can keep up with the producer and messages aren't piling up. But if the lag keeps growing, it means the consumer is falling behind and messages are starting to accumulate. If this buildup becomes too large, it can impact business processes, so consumer lag is a key metric to monitor. There are typically two consumption models for message queues, push and pull. In a push model, the server pushes messages to the consumer. In a pull model, the consumer actively requests messages from the server. Kafka uses the pull model, where consumers pull messages from the server. This reduces the server's workload and improves performance and scalability, but it also adds some complexity to the client side since consumers need to manage their consumption state. That's all we'll cover for consumers for now. It's important to note that there are many other key concepts related to consumers in Kafka, including offset commits, partition assignment, consumer rebalancing, and consumer groups. We'll dive deeper into these in future videos. As time goes on, the amount of data in a topic will usually keep growing. To save disk space, Kafka supports retention policies, which regularly delete old data. There are two common retention policies. One based on time, by default, Kafka deletes data older than seven days, and one based on file size. When a file reaches a certain size, Kafka deletes the oldest data files. Kafka is a distributed, high-performance, and scalable messaging system. If a topic only has one queue, it could become a performance bottleneck as the data volume grows. To solve this issue, Kafka uses a method similar to traditional database sharding by splitting a queue into multiple subqueues. These subqueues in Kafka are called partitions. By using partitions, Kafka can distribute data across different partitions which helps balance the load and improve processing capacity. Each partition is assigned a number, like P0, P1, P2, and so on. Unlike database sharding, adding partitions to a Kafka topic is easy. You just need to run a simple command. In theory, there's no strict limit on the number of partitions. In fact, some large internet companies have topics with more than 100 partitions, which is fairly common. A partition is a logical concept, but it's implemented physically as files. Each partition corresponds to different physical files, meaning that partitions are physically isolated from one another. Once partitions are introduced, producers need to figure out how to distribute messages across them. This is where producer load balancing comes into play. Kafka offers two common distribution strategies. Strategy 1, Round Robin. In this strategy, the producer sends messages to each partition in sequence. For example, let's say topic A has three partitions, P0, P1, and P2. When the producer sends five messages, message one will go to P0, message twos to P1, message three to P2, message four back to P0, and message five to P1. This pattern continues, ensuring that messages are evenly spread across the partitions. Strategy 2. Key-Based Hashing In this strategy, the producer assigns a key to each message, like a user ID. Kafka's client library then hashes the key and uses the result to assign the message to a specific partition. This ensures that messages with the same key always go to the same partition. For instance, 
Suppose the producer sends five messages, each with a user ID as the key. Messages from user 123 might go to P1, user 456 to P0, and user 789 to P2. If the producer sends another message from user 123, it will still go to P1, and the same applies to user 456. This strategy is particularly useful when you need to process messages from the same user in order. One important thing to note is that after introducing partitions, Kafka only guarantees message order within a single partition. Messages across different partitions are not guaranteed to be in order. So, if your application requires strict message ordering, you'll need to make sure those messages are sent to the same partition. If you found this lesson helpful, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to the ByteVigor channel so you won't miss out on more exciting content in the future. See you in the next video.